What happened at Redcliffe? Yes, I know. I've had some time to think about it now. I just wanted to thank you. You went out of your way to save the Arles family, and you did it. Even though it would have been easier not to. There's been so much death and destruction. It... Well, it, it makes me feel good that at least we were able to save something. No matter how small. I owed the Arles that much. You're right. Hopefully, by that time, there's still enough of Ferelden left to save. Good. Now that the warm, fuzzy part of the day is over with, we can get back to the ritual dismemberments. Oh, wait. It's not Tuesday, is it? You know, maybe this isn't the best time to be thinking about this, but I have something to ask you. Chances are we'll be heading to Denerim soon. And when we're there, I wonder if we might be able to... Look someone up. I'm not talking about a friend, exactly. And no, it's not that sort of friend either. The thing is, I have a sister, a half-sister. I told you about my mother, right? She was a servant at Redcliffe Castle and she had a daughter. Only, I never knew about her. I don't think she knew about me either. They kept my birth a secret, after all. But, after I became a Grey Warden, I did some checking, and, well, I found out she's still alive, in Denerim. No, I thought about writing her, but I never did. And then we were called down to Ostagar, and I never got the chance. She's the only real family I have left, the only family not also mixed up in the whole royal thing. I've just been thinking that maybe it's time I went to see her. With the blight coming and everything, I, I don't know if I'll ever get another chance to see her. Maybe I can help her. Warn her about the danger, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know anything about her except her name and where she lives. Her name is Goldana, and I think she remarried but still lives just outside the alienage. If we're in the area, then, well, it's worth a look. Something on your mind? Of course. You never asked? Uh, all right. If you want the full explanation, I'll give it to you. The thing is, I'm used to not telling anyone who didn't already know. It was always a secret. Even Duncan was the only Grey Warden who knew. And then after the battle, when I should have told you, uh, I don't know, it seemed like it was too late by then. How do you just tell someone that? I... I should have told you, anyway. It was important for you to know. I guess part of me liked you not knowing. They treat me differently. I become the bastard prince to them, instead of just Alistair. I know that must sound stupid to you, but I hate that it shaped my entire life. I never wanted it, and I certainly don't want to be king. The very idea of it terrifies me. Hello? Have you met me? I... I'm no leader of men. I don't want to be the person sitting on the throne and making decisions that affect the lives of others. That it just isn't me. I guess I should be thankful that Arl Eamon is far more likely to inherit the throne. If he's all right. I hope he's all right. And for what it's worth, I'm sorry for not telling you sooner. It was a dumb thing to do. I guess it's kind of a relief that you know now. Let's go. Something on your mind? Of course. Such as they are. About the Grey Wardens, anyhow. Fair enough. Something on your mind? You are not quite as callow as I thought. That is... unexpected. You sound surprised. You must have heard this before. You'll get over it. Eventually. 
I was sent to be the eyes of the Antom. The Arishok asked, what is the Blight? By his curiosity, I am now here. Yes. I cannot go home. It doesn't matter now. Can we move on? We keep the Darkspawn waiting. Does it matter? Very well. I caged myself. A weak mind is a deadly foe, as you are no doubt aware. I came to your lands with seven of the Beresad, my brothers, to seek answers about the Blight. We made our way across the Ferelden countryside without incident, seeing nothing of the threat we were sent to observe. Until the night we camped by Lake Kalanhad. They came from everywhere. The earth beneath our feet, the air above us. Our own shadows harbored the Darkspawn. I saw the last of the creatures cut down, too late. I fell. I am told no others survived. I don't know how long I lay on the battlefield among the dead. Nor do I know how the farmers found me. I only know that when I woke I was no longer among my brothers. And my sword was gone from my hand. Perhaps. I searched for it. And when that failed I asked my rescuers what had become of it. I killed them. With my bare hands. I did. I knew they didn't have the blade. They had no reason to lie to me. I panicked. Unthinking, I struck them down. Do your people have no souls as we know them? Convenient for you. That sword was made for my hand alone. I have carried it from the day I was set into the Beresad. I was to die wielding it for my people. Even if I could cross Ferelden and Tevinter, unarmed and alone, to bring my report to the Arishok, I would be slain on sight by the Antarm. They would know me as Solas, a deserter. No soldier would cast aside his blade while he drew breath. If I knew where to look, it would be in my hand now. What would you have me do? It could be anywhere by now. Near Lake Kalanhad. Perhaps those words are empty, but thank you all the same. You called. I caged myself. A weak mind is a deadly foe, as you are no doubt aware. I came to your lands with seven of the Beresad, my brothers, to seek answers about the Blight. We made our way across the Ferelden countryside without incident, seeing nothing of the threat we were sent to observe. Until the night we camped by Lake Kalanhad. They came from everywhere. The earth beneath our feet, the air above us. Our own shadows harbored the Darkspawn. I saw the last of the creatures cut down, too late. I fell. I am told no others survived. I don't know how long I lay on the battlefield among the dead. Nor do I know how the farmers found me. I only know that when I woke I was no longer among my brothers. And my sword was gone from my hand. I searched for it. And when that failed I asked my rescuers what had become of it. I killed them. With my bare hand. I did. I knew they didn't. They would know me as Solas, a deserter. If I knew where to look. Near Lake Kalanhat. You called. Speak, then. Then I suggest we move on. I am hardly surprised. To put it lightly, no one has a place here. Your farmers wish to be merchants. The merchants dream of being nobles, and the nobles become warriors. No one is content to be who they are. What does that accomplish? The farmer who buys a shop is never a merchant. He is always a farmer turned merchant. He carries his old life with him as a turtle carries its shell. Happiness is fragile. Nothing can be built upon it that will last. Only duty endures. You can learn to find it in doing your duty, in serving your people. There is no need to search for it. Shall we move on? There is... interesting food here. You have a thing. It doesn't have a word in the Kunari tongue. Little baked things, like 
bread, but sweet and crumbly. Yes, we have no such things in our lands. This should be remedied. Perhaps. It's strange to be in a crowd and hear a language that is not your own. To see faces that are and aren't like yours. I miss the smells of Saharon. Tea and incense and the sea. Ferelden smells of wet dogs. Skunks don't mind the smell of other skunks either. Shall we move on? Speak then. Then I suggest we move on. As you wish. Here I am. Oh, this should be good. Go ahead. Well now, I imagine that's a very fair question. Being an assassin after all is a, a living, at least as far as such things go. I was simply never given the opportunity to choose another way. So if that choice presents itself, why should I not seize upon it? Hmm? To be truthful, I didn't even know the crows existed when I joined them. I was but a boy of seven when I was purchased. For three sovereigns, I'm told. Which is a good price, considering I was all ribs and bone and didn't know the pommel of a dagger from the pointy end. The crows buy all their assassins that way. Buy them young, raise them to know nothing else but murder. And if you do poorly in your training, you die. Of course. You compete against your fellow assassins, and those who survive are rightfully proud of it. In Antiva, being a crow gets you respect. It gets you wealth. It gets you women. And men. Or whatever it is you might fancy. But that does not mean doing what is expected of you always. And it means being expendable. It's a cage, if a gilded cage. Pretty, but confining. I fancy many things. I fancy things that are beautiful, and things that are strong. I fancy things that are dangerous and exciting. Would you be offended if I said I fancied you? Ah, that's too bad. I do so enjoy it when I get to be flirty. As for what I'll do in the future, presuming that there is one, I truly can't imagine. It might be interesting to go into business for myself, for a change. Far away from Antiva, of course. For now, naturally, I go where you go. Everything changes, my friend. Come now, enough chit-chat. Talking about the crows summons them, you know. Any Antivan fishwife could tell you so. Here I am. Oh, this should be good. Go ahead. Well... The crows would have you believe that it is an involved process that takes years of training. The sort that tests both your resolve and your endurance. Survive that process and maybe, just maybe, you're good enough to start being considered one of them. But quite frankly, the truth is that all it requires is a desire to kill people for a living. It's surprising how well one can do in such a field. Now, now, it need not be thought of so crudely. We all do our share of murdering around here, don't we? An assassin simply specializes in striking from stealth, and in maximizing that first attack to be as lethal as possible. Debilitate your foe, either by poison or by crippling their limbs, makes any follow-up combat you need to engage in that much simpler. See? Getting paid for the act is beside the point. An assassin is more a tactical choice than a lifestyle. Of course, the crows like to pretend that their abilities are trade secrets, shrouded in shadows and wrapped in a blanket of mystery. So let's just keep this between you and me, shall we? Hmm? Here I am. Oh, this should be good. Go ahead. And why not? There are many things to enjoy about being a crow in Antiva. You are respected, uh, you are feared, the authorities go out of their way to overlook your trespasses, even the rewards are nothing to turn your nose up at. As for the killing part, well, some people simply need assassinating. Or do you disagree? 
I often find myself the instrument of fate, ending these lives for one necessity or another. I console myself with the notion that most of them had it coming. As far as enjoying the act of killing itself, why not? There is a certain artistry to the deed, the pleasure of sinking your blade into their flesh and knowing that their life is in your hands. It is not pleasure, per se, nothing sexual. It is more a sense of satisfaction, a feeling of power. Does that make sense? No matter. There are many things I did not enjoy about being a crow, of course. Having no choice, being treated as an expendable commodity, the rules, oh, so many rules. But simply being an assassin, I like it just fine. I will continue to do it if I can, even if I am not a crow. Honestly, could you picture me doing something else? Whereas I am content merely doing what I happen to be good at. It's a talent that not many come by, honestly. I don't see why I need not pursue it. Of course, all these thoughts are moot. Chances are still good that you and I will perish, eaten by darkspawn or slain by the crows at some point. Very gruesomely, I imagine. But it is pleasant enough to chat about. Come, let's move on while our boots still have some wear in them. Here I am. Oh, this should be good. Go ahead. Oh, you wish to know about Antiva, do you? The only way to truly appreciate it would be to go there. It is a warm place, not cold and harsh like this Ferelden. In Antiva it rains often, but the flowers are always in bloom. Or so the saying goes. Every land has its assassins. Some are simply more open about their business than others. I hail from the glorious Antiva city, home to the royal palace. It is a glittering gem amidst the sand, my Antiva city. Do you come from someplace comparable? Oh, I have never seen that place. I am sure it has its charms and its dogs. <laughs> hmm. You know what is most odd? We speak of my homeland, and for all its wine and its dark-haired beauties and the lilo flutes of the minstrels, I miss the leather the most. I mean the smell. For years I lived in a tiny apartment near Antiva City's leather-making district, in a building where the crows stored their youngest recruits, packed in like crates. I grew accustomed to the stench, even though the humans complained of it constantly. To this day, the smell of fresh leather is what reminds me most of home, more than anything else. Oh, not so long, I know. It is my first time away from Antiva, however, and the thought of never returning makes me think of it constantly. Before I left, I was tempted to spend what little coin I possessed on leather boots I spotted in the store window. Finest Antivan leather. Perfect craftsmanship. Ah, but I was a fool to leave them. I thought, ah, Zevran, you can buy them when you return as a reward for a job well done. More the fool I, no? True, and it's a comforting thought. One simply never knows what is to come next. How could I have suspected I would end up defeated by a handsome Grey Warden? A man who then spares my life? I could not. Quite right you are. I see the Grey Wardens do not recruit fools. Now, if it is all the same to you, I would prefer not to speak more of Antiva. It makes me wistful and hungry for a proper meal. Here I am. Oh, this should be good. Go ahead. Yes? Well, here I am. What is meant by someone like me? Did you think I was always a cloistered sister? The Chantry provides succor and safe harbor to all who seek it. I chose to stay and become a fund. I was a traveling minstrel in Orle. Tales and songs were my life. I performed, and they rewarded me with applause and coin. And my skill in battle? Well, you pick up different skills when you travel, yes? 
Yes, of course. Um, let's move on. Yes? Well, here I am. Of course I do. I love stories far too much to keep them to myself. Everyone should be able to benefit from them, I think. Chantry Law says it is man's pride that created the Darkspawn. In ages past, the mages of the Tevinder Imperium ruled much of the world we know. In their pride, they thought their magics invincible and imagined that they were greater than the Maker himself. So thinking, they invaded his golden city, planning to take it for themselves and depose their own creator. But they were impure and full of sin. And it is with the sin that they tainted the golden city, corrupting it forever. The Maker cursed them and cast them from his sight. Wherever they went, they spread the taint of their sin. Any land that was touched by the taint became blighted and would suffer no life. Instead, the darkspawn arose to torment us and remind us of our hubris. Of course, Olesians enjoy telling stories. I shall tell you my favorite tale of Aveline, the Knight of Ole. A long time ago, a girl child was born to a farmer. He had hoped for a son, not a daughter, and so he told his wife to abandon the child in the woods. Before the cold could claim her, the baby was found by a tribe of Dalish elves who took pity on the poor mewling thing and raised her as their own. Aveline, for that is what they called her, grew strong and quick and clever under the guidance of the elves. She learned to wield a sword as well as any man, could kill a deer with an arrow at hundred paces, and was as graceful on the back of a horse as she was on foot. Aveline's Dalish guardians saw that she could easily best any Olesian chevalier in battle, and wanted to show the cruel humans the child they had left to die. They bestowed upon her a fine horse and armor, and sent her to prove herself to her people in the Grand Tourney. Now in those days, no woman was allowed to take up arms, let alone compete in the Grand Tourney, but Aveline kept her helmet on and was not discovered. Aveline won many events and gained the approval of the adoring crowd. Eventually, she came face to face with the knight Kaleva in the Grand Melee. Aveline had already bested him in the joust, and Kaleva was determined not to lose a second time. Out of desperation to regain his honor, Kaleva tripped Aveline and tossed her to the ground, ripping off her helmet as he did so. Silence fell upon the arena as Aveline was revealed. Kaleva declared the previous competitions invalid. A woman had taken part, and this was not allowed. But the crowd cheered for Aveline. Kaleva was furious, for he had lost to a woman and was now being shamed. Blinded by his rage, he forced Aveline to her knees. Know your place, woman, cried he, and slit her throat. The son of the king, Prince Freyan, was present. He recognized Aveline's skill and bravery and began to see the injustice done to the women in his land. When he was made king, he rewrote the laws of Ole so that women could also become chevalier. He honored Aveline and knighted her after her death. And to this day, any female who is knighted reveres Aveline the Brave, for she is the patron of all women chevalier. I know one, told to me by my mother a long time ago, it always chilled me to the bone. Maybe you have heard of Flemeth? Ferelden mothers scare their daughters with talk of Flemeth. They say that if you're bad, Flemeth will spirit you away and bind you to her forever. They also say that Flemeth mourns her lost beauty and will steal yours through your looking glass if she catches you. Flemeth's beauty was known throughout the land. She had hair like unto a moonless night, skin as pale as winter's first snow, and eyes as beautiful and perilous as the sea. When she came of age, 
She came to the attention of the Lord of Hyever, Conobar, and he took her for his wife. Conobar soon learned that his young bride had the gift of magic. He kept this a secret, for he feared that she would be taken from him. Flemeth stayed with Conobar for some years, and with his blessing, she practiced her art. And then one day, a young poet named Osen came to the castle. Flemeth was captivated by Osen's voice, and he by her beauty, and they fell in love. Flemeth longed to be with her true love, and she and Osen fled from Conobar's lands, seeking refuge in the Kokari wilds with the chasing tribes. They lived there happily for many a year, till the day Flemeth received news that Conobar was dying and longed to see her face one last time. Flemeth's heart swelled with pity for the man who once was her husband, and begged Osen to return to Conobar's side with her. But when Flemeth and Osen entered Hyeva, they were captured by Conobar's men, and Osen was slain in front of Flemeth's eyes. Flemeth was imprisoned in the highest tower of the castle, there to await Conobar's judgment on her. Distraught at the loss of her love, Flemeth plotted revenge against her husband. She summoned a fey demon, intending for it to wreak vengeance on Conobar. But a spell went awry. The demon possessed Flemeth. Turning her into an abomination, the halls of the castle ran red with blood as Flemeth slaughtered Conobar and all his men. The last of Flemeth's humanity melted away, and at dawn, she stole back to the wilds to plot and scheme for a hundred years. They say she took to her side many chastened men, and with their help, begat her daughter witches, who even now prowl the dark places of the Kokari wilds. Yes? Well, here I am. I knew this would come up sooner or later. I don't know how to explain, but I had a dream. In it, there was an impenetrable darkness. It was so dense, so real. And there was a noise, a terrible, ungodly noise. I stood on a peak and watched as the darkness consumed everything. And when the storm swallowed the last of the sun's light, I... I fell, and the darkness drew me in. I have had dreams. This was different somehow. When I woke, I went to the Chantry's gardens, as I always do. But that day, the rose bush in the corner had flowered. Everyone knew that bush was dead. It was grey and twisted and gnarled, the ugliest thing you ever saw. But there it was. A single, beautiful rose. It was as though the Maker stretched out his hand to say, Even in the midst of this darkness, there is hope and beauty. Have faith. I suppose you will never understand. No one does. It's all right. I know what I know. And no one will ever make that untrue. Yes? Well, here I am.